let's finish on, on certificates and, and this aspect of web security. So next week we can move on to a different aspect of web security. We got to, yes, on th Tuesday this, this case saying we want to use public keys to encrypt secret keys. So the browser and the server need to secure their communications and to do that we're going to encrypt our data with symmetric key cryptography. So sir, a browser A, server B, in order to encrypt the data first we need to both have the same secret key. And in this example, so this is similar to the diagram we come up with at the end of Tuesday. And the Tuesdays maybe even be better. The idea was that A and B both need to have a shared secret key K A B. They both need to know that. So the approach is that A chooses this value, say a random key, and to get it to B, A encrypts using public key encrypto cryptography. So the idea, although I've written C here in red, the idea is that A would encrypt with B's public key, P-U-B, and therefore send that ciphertext to B, and if it was encrypted with B's public key, only B could decrypt and get that secret value. That's the idea. But there's a flaw with that approach. If some malicious user C here, if they can get A to think that B's public key is some other value, in particular the public key that C knows, the malicious user, so if this malicious user can trick A into thinking, here's the public key of B, here's the value, but in fact it's the public key of C. So what A does is they encrypt this secret value that they've chosen with the public key of C, they send it to B across the internet. But somewhere in between computer of A and B, C intercepts that packet or those packets. Before they go on to B, they intercept them. Because it was encrypted with the public key of C, the malicious user can decrypt and get this secret KAB. So the malicious user learns the secret value that A chose. And then what the malicious user does is that they encrypt that same secret value with the original, the true public key of B, and forward that message on to B. So this is what's sent to B, encrypt of KAB with PUB. B receives this message, thinking it's from A, decrypts, because they have the private key of B, they get KAB, so B has just received a message, they think this comes from A. When I communicate now with A, I'm going to use the secret key KAB. And similar, when A receives data encrypted from B, it's going to use a secret key KAB. So they think they're going to communicate securely using this secret key, but what the malicious user is going to do is whenever A and B send data from now on, the malicious user, if they can intercept that data, they can decrypt it because they know also KAB. Okay? So that's the attack that if we use public keys, there's this scenario which, under two conditions, under the condition that the malicious user can fool A into using the wrong public key. That's the first thing for this attack to work. So. Here's the public key of Steve. You use it to encrypt data to send to me. But in fact, it's not my public key. It's another student's public key, but you don't know that. So if someone can fool you into using the wrong public key, and if that malicious user can intercept the communications, because that's required here. So if they can do that, then this attack is successful, and our encryption is not secure or our communications are not secure. Is it easy to do this? Well, to intercept is generally easy in the internet because in the internet, between your computer and web servers, there are many different locations where someone could intercept. Over the Wi-Fi network, 
Okay, the packets going from your laptop up to the access point inside SIT, anyone can intercept and get copies of that. Modifying is harder. But if you had access to the devices in the internet service provider, anywhere in the world that the packets go through, then you, someone could intercept and do this. So if you want secure communications, you don't want to rely on the fact that internet service providers are trustworthy. Assume that there may be people there that would do this. So it's generally easy to do this. Now how easy it is to fool A into using the wrong key, again, not so hard. Unless we have other mechanisms to make sure that when A uses a key, that they're confident that it is B's key. It's not someone else's. And that leads to certificates. Okay. Questions before we go to certificates? He is in the internet, or she is and, in the and, internet. And, and, I mean, uh, because the internet, they have many parts. So, so, so they, they need to be somewhere between... So A is a computer on the internet, B is a computer on the internet, and they're sending packets to each other. A, the malicious user needs to be somewhere where those packets flow th via. And they need to be able to intercept those packets, and take a copy, and send new packets in their place. Where can you do that? At access points, if you have physical access to network devices, switches and routers, maybe a wire, a, a LAN cable. If a malicious user can, okay, they know all the traffic going from uh, here to Rungsit via some cables. If they can go to one of those cables, dig a hole, cut that cable, and insert a device that would take the packets, modify them, and send on new ones, then they can do this attack. So anywhere between the source and destination, they need to be able to access those packets. But, but in, the, in the internet, the, the packet can, be, can go in many... Yes. They, they can't be anywhere in the internet. They need to be on the path between A and B. So, so can I say, like, uh, from the endpoint to the ISP, and another, another uh, from the ISP to another endpoint? Uh, for, for, they for need to, the, the to packets the take ISP. a path through the internet, okay? So you need to be, the attacker needs to be on that path. Okay, same as if you drive into Bangkok along with one particular path, you need to be on that particular path to intercept. So if our packets go from Bangkok to Tokyo, across the Pacific to California, and then to a web server, those specific links and those specific devices that the packets go via, to do this attack, the attacker needs to have access to them. They cannot be in Europe. To, to do the attack, they need to have access to those particular links that those packets go via. And if they're not, yeah, they cannot do the attack. But getting access to those links, well, we cannot assume that they are always <coughs> secure. So assume that it is possible to get access. Of course, sometimes it's going to be harder than others, but assume someone can. So they need to be on the path that those packets go via. That's the condition there. So we need a way so that A, when it has a public key, it knows for sure it is B's public key. How do we do that? How does A know for sure this is B's public key? Trust someone, trust who, trust, yeah, you need to trust someone. Trust, trust some other organization to do what? And what do those, that other organization do? Verify, yeah, the other, organi you need some other organization that you do trust to, to uh, confirm that this is the correct public key. Okay, so you need some other entity to say, <coughs> 
when you're using this public key, this indeed is the public key of B. Okay, so we need some other organization to do that. Or some other entity. We get a trusted third party to confirm it is, in this case in web browsing, to confirm it's the server's public key. So when your browser has a public key and it says it's from the public key for facebook.com, then we need some other entity to confirm this is the, the public key of Facebook. It's not the pub, public key of someone pretending to be Facebook. So this trusted third party, we say, is another entity in the system that we trust. We, in this case, the browser trusts. And the concept is, to, is implemented using digital certificates. So there are two steps on these two slides. We'll briefly mention and then draw some diagrams to capture them. So we assume that the server, the web server, or the owner of that server, creates their key pair. You know, it's P-U-S-P-R-S. That is the, the key pair of the web server. They create their own. And then they go to some trusted third party that we'll call the Certificate Authority, CA. Some organization, some entity. They go to them and say, I own this server. They show them their ID. So we denote that as the identity of the server, IDS. And that certificate authority, once it can confirm that this server owner, the identity matches that of the server, and that this is the public key, then they issue a certificate saying, this public key is in fact belonging to this identity. Okay, so this is what the, a digital certificate does. It confirms that a public key belongs to a particular user. And they issue a certificate. And the way the, issue, the certificate is structured is that it contains the identity of the server, say a domain name, www.facebook.com. It contains the public key of the server that the server chose, or the server owner. Maybe a timestamp to say that this certificate is valid from today for another year, so that we can uh, uh, expire the certificate if needed. And then a form for uh, the authority being able to prove to others that it has confirmed that this identity and public key are, are related. So it signs the, those values. So we use a digital signature. Remember a signature is you encrypt the data using your private key. Well, practically we encrypt the hash of the data using the private key. So we see here the CA uses their private key to encrypt the hash of this information. That is the ID of the server, the public key of the server, and some timestamp T. That's the concept. Saying, so this certificate is saying, here is the public key of this entity, and I, as the CA, confirm that. And later we'll see that others can check, validate or verify that uh, public key by decrypting with the public key of the CA and compare it. So validate the, the signature. So this is the certificate of a particular server S a, of facebook.com. It contains the public key, the identity of the, the server, a timestamp, and this part here is the signature this data encrypted and signed by the CA. So we use a timestamp, for example, to say how long this is valid for, so that after one year or six months you need to get a new certificate. So it's not valid forever. Now, this is the general concept. There are specific formats for these certificates. And X509 is the standard that specifies the, the common format used for certificates. We'll see some examples of that. 
So when we say the identity and public key, what actual information is stored there for web servers? We'll see a particular format for that shortly. So that's the first step. Every, think of every web server obtains a certificate. And usually that's done, uh, I would say, manually. Uh, it's not done um, automatically across the network. It involves some, some user, the owner of the server, somehow confirming that they do own this website. So if I go to some certificate authority and say, please give me a certificate for www.facebook.com, the authority should say no unless I can prove that I own that domain it, they should not issue me a certificate they should have some way to uh, to verify that this person asking for the certificate and this public key is in fact the owner of that domain so step one servers obtain certificates step two now when a browser accesses a website So back to our case, browser A accesses the website B. Well, we, we need, the browser needs to find the public key of B. So to do that, the browser initiates communications with this server. The server sends its certificate to the browser. So it sends CS to the browser. So the browser now has CS. And Let's just go back. So the browser receives this information and it includes the identity of the website, say the domain name, the public key of the server. But how do we know this is the public key of this server and not someone pretending to be this server? Well, we know because this information is signed by someone we trust. So we as the browser trust the certificate authority because this information is signed by the certificate authority, we trust this information. How do we confirm that? Well, if it's signed by the, using the private key of the authority, then to verify this is correct, we decrypt that signature using the public key of the authority. So my browser, when it receives a certificate, it verifies that certificate by decrypting this component with the public key of the authority. For that to work, the browser must have the public key of the authority. And that's where we say the certificate authority is a trusted third party in that we know the public key of the authority and we know for sure that's the correct one. Once the browser can verify this is the correct certificate signed by a trusted authority, then it has the public key and we can continue and do these steps correctly. That is, instead of using the wrong key, we can make sure that we have the correct public key and avoiding the attack. So this assumes the browser already knows the public key of the authority and trusts it. That's where we say the authority is a trusted third party. The browser knows for sure this is the correct public key. If not, we have problems. Let's see how that works as an example. We have our browser. Uh, and some server. Uh, with some domain, okay, fb.com. That's the identity of the server, the domain is. So the browser. Uh, visits the website. So someone types or clicks on a link to the, the URL. We're using HTTPS. Uh, 
with that domain. And maybe some path, but we focus on the domain. So the browser wants to access fb.com securely, therefore it needs to encrypt the data. So to do so, we need the public key of fb.com. So this is when we use secure socket layer, SSL, to do some hello exchange. And the server will send its certificate to the browser. So the server has a certificate already. Uh, let's denote it as CFB. That is the certificate of FB.com which inclu includes the values that uh, the public key, so it includes the identity, say the domain name, the public key, a timestamp, and that information is also signed. So the certificate is those three values plus the sig sig signature where the signature is the private key, that's not of CA and I'm going to run out of space of the hash of all of the above information. all of these values. That is, the certificate contains identity, public key, a timestamp, and then all of that is hashed and encrypted with the private key of an authority, and that's the signature. So the certificate is all of these four values, the signature plus these three values, in the same structure as on, on the slide. That certificate is sent by the server to the browser. So after the browser contacts the server, they eventually send back the certificate. And now the browser verifies the certificate. That's important that we don't just trust the certificate that we've received, we must verify that it's correct. How do we verify it? How does the browser verify the received certificate? Again, how does the browser verify this? So they just received a certificate. How do they verify that it's correct? Use the something, use the public key of, of CA to do what? What do they do with the public key of CA? Decrypt, decrypt S. Okay, so remember the certificate contains, think of these four values, so they decrypt the signature part. In, in the slide, the signature is, S is this part. It's these three values hashed and encrypted with a private key. So this is S, the signature part in my picture. So yes, they decrypt that using the public key of CA. I'll just denote S here, which is this value. If nothing's been changed, if everything's correct, then they should get, when they decrypt, they'll get a hash value as the output. That is, the input was a hash value, so when they decrypt, they'll get a hash value as output, and they'll compare that hash value with the hash of these three values that they have. 
And this is just the normal signature, that if the hash of those received values matches the decrypted hash value, everything's assumed to be correct. So once they get the hash value here, they hash those three values and compare. We can write that. So the output of decryption will be some hash value, let's say h, and then they take the hash of the received values of id, the public key, and the timestamp, and they compare these two values. Let's say this is h1, this is h2, if they match, everything's trusted. If they don't match, don't trust. Okay, so this is the normal approach that we've considered with signatures. And if they match, then we now know that this public key, the public key of FB, belongs to FB. Why do we know that? Because we, it was signed by someone we trust. We trust this certificate authority to issue certificates only to the people who can identify that they are the owner of a particular public key. So as long as we trust CA, we trust now the public key of FB, and now we can encrypt a secret and send it to the server and set up our secure communication. Questions so far? So we receive a certificate, verify that certificate. To verify, we need to know the public key of CA. Where did that come from? So that's an assumption in this process that the browser already has the public key of the certificate authority. And normally, the public key of a certificate authority is stored as a certificate itself. The public key of CA is self stored as a self-signed certificate. So it's the identity of CA, the name of the authority, the public key of the authority, some timestamp saying how long it's valid for, and all of that is signed, so the hash of those values, encrypted with a private key of the authority. Note this is, this is self-signed. Who signed these values? Whose private key did we use? We used our own in this case. That is, the authority is signing this public key of itself. So we call this a special case of a self-signed certificate. Whereas a normal certificate, the public key and other information is signed by someone else. Okay, CA signed this information. But a self-signed certificate, you sign your own information. We can do that because, again, we've assumed that the browser trusts the authority. So if they issue a self-signed certificate, we'll trust that. We must trust someone. Okay. So how do we get the public key of the CA? Usually the browser has pre-programmed into it, pre-loaded, a set of self-signed certificates of authorities. And in, in the real world, we don't just have one authority, we have many different authorities. And the browsers are configured such that they have these self-signed certificates of many different authorities. So whenever your browser receives a certificate from a server, it uses these certificates of authorities to verify the server certificates. So P, P, U, C, A come from the self-signed certificate that the browser already has. Any questions before we look at some more examples and some issues? So understand the structure, the structure of a digital certificate. 
Importantly, it contains a public key and an identity signed by someone else, an authority. And where the signature is what we've covered in previous topics is just encrypted hash using a private key. That's the signature. If, if the CA that we trust is hacked, that is someone uh, else gets that private key, then we should not trust them. Okay, so when we say the CA is trusted, in theory it assumes that uh, they will not do anything malicious and no one can force them to do anything malicious, like sign certificates of people who don't own those servers. But in practice, yes, if the CA is compromised in some way, then the security of this scheme fa fails or may fail. So it all depends upon that the CA is trustworthy. But if something goes wrong with the CA, then something can go wrong with this scheme. Okay. So if someone can access the authority and do malicious things, then our uh, certificate scheme will not uh, be secure. Uh, we can have a hierarchy. Let's go to an example and see in a browser some certificates and we'll see the generals, we'll see uh, some real certificates. So here is the concept. We say the certificate contains an ID, a public key and so on. But in practice though the structure of the certificate is defined by a standard. So we'll see some real certificates. It's X509 format and we'll see that there's a hierarchy of certificates. Uh, let's go. So let's open up a website. So I go to some URL. So in my browser I'm going to visit, so it's hard to see, so HTTPS and then some domain. So I want to visit some website and I want the communications to be secure. Therefore, my browser will need to get the certificate of this web server and verify the certificate. And of course, it should all happen in the background, uh, that is, not from the user's perspective. And how is it performed? HTTPS does this. We'll see a capture shortly, but the, the exchanges of obtaining the certificate is done via uh, HTTPS the protocol using SSL. So we access some website. Does my internet access work? Maybe not. Right, here we go. Just access a website. Okay. And now let's see information about the certificate. And you can often in different browsers you see a, a lock here indicating this is secured and trusted. And we can see some more information And if we look at this security feature, we see that it says this, this website, the domain www.eff.org, is verified by some other organization, startcom.limited. Okay. Let's look at the actual certificate. So what's happened when I access that website, HTTPS <coughs> uses SSL to do an exchange between browser and server, and one of those exchanges is that the server sends its certificate to my browser and my browser then verifies that certificate. So let's look, view the certificate that my browser received. Uh, can we zoom? This is a summary of the certificate. We can zoom a little bit. So with the certificate we talk about who's the subject, who is, this, who is the certificate issued to, 
that is, who is the identity and the public key, and who is the authority that issued the certificate, who was it issued by. So in this case, this certificate was issued to the, a particular domain, anything.eff.org. So in websites, certificates are to domains. And some name, all right, the name of the organisation that owns that, some uh, serial number to identify this certificate, so some unique value. Who is the authority? Who issued this certificate? Again, some other name, Startcom Class 2 Primary Intermediate CA, I think if you read on there. So some organisation is the authority in this case. And the timestamp information. This certificate was issued on this date, the 11th of November, and expires in two years from when it was issued. So there may be different uh, time frames for when the certificate is valid. Meaning, after this date, your browser, if it receives this certificate, should not trust it because it, it's expired. What should happen is that the server should get a new certificate every two years in this case, for example. So that's a summary information. Uh, remember, a certificate contains a signature. What's a signature? It's the hash of those values encrypted with a private key. Uh, the fingerprints is just some summary information about that uh, certificate. We'll see the details. So we look at the details. And it's not a great way to view, but if we expand, I'm going to look at the details of this one certificate. And the format is this X509 format. So it defines all the fields that we must include in the certificate. There's a, a version of the, the certificate, version 3 of X509. The certificate has a serial number, so some unique value. The algorithms used, remember we use a, a public key algorithm to encrypt the hash value. But what hash algorithm do we use and what public key algorithm? Well, we're using SHA-1 as the hash algorithm and RSA as the encryption algorithm. So it says what algorithm is used. You may use different algorithms. The issuer is who who issued this certificate? Who is the authority? There's a common name, so some string that identifies. Startcom is just a company, a class two primary intermediate, uh, I think server is down there, and some organizational unit, so some department and some short name and the country code. So this is the authority identifier. The timestamps, so it's not valid before this date, it's not valid after that date. The subject is whose certificate it is. Issued to, and we see the information about EFF.org. So the common name is the domain name plus some other identifying information of the, the, the server. So this is the web server information and the country, for example. <coughs> and then if we scroll down, okay, remember inside a certificate we have an identity and a public key. So here is the public key information. The algorithm used for the public key, RSA, and the actual public key. And we haven't looked at the RSA algorithm, but this, our public key is in two values, a, a modulus and some value E. So this is the actual key. Then we have some extensions. We will not go through extensions, some extra information that may be useful in practice. The signature algorithm, again, to sign we take the hash using SHA-1 and encrypt using RSA and the actual signature. So this part is, in, in my diagram, the value of S. 
So if we take the hash of all the other values, we encrypt with RSA using the private key of Starcom, the issuer, we get this 2048-bit value. That's the signature. So the format's slightly different from in, in our slides, but the information is included there. So really, <coughs> the issuer is the authority. The subject is the server. The subject public key information is the public key of the server. And the signature is that last uh, value, the hashed values encrypted with a private key. Now, my browser received this. How did it verify? How did my browser verify this certificate that it received? So the certificate is owned by EFF. EFF.org is the uh, domain, the website. The issuer is this Starcom Class 2 Primary Intermediate Server CA, CA Certificate Authority. This is the person who, or the organization that issued the certificate and signed it. How does my browser verify this certificate? What did my browser do? What information did my browser need to know to verify? How do we verify a certificate? We receive a certificate. What do we do to verify it? Back to our lecture notes. When you receive this certificate, how do you verify? It's signed by the private key of the CA, therefore you, to verify you use the public key of the CA to decrypt the signature and compare the hash values. So you need to know the public key of the CA to verify. In this case, the CA is the Startcom Class 2 Primary Intermediate Server. So my browser needs to know the public key of this CA to verify this certificate. And the public keys are stored also in certificates. And in fact, here we see a hierarchy. We're viewing the certificate from the web server. This next one is the certificate of this authority, <coughs> the Startcom Class 2 Primary Intermediate CA. So let's note what we've got. Uh, in our example, we can say we had my browser received a certificate of what was it, EFF.org. And that certificate was signed. Yep. In step one, CS is the certificate of the server. Yep. Uh, to do the verification, no, we verify this certificate. Yep. Okay. How do we verify this certificate? What do we need? public key of CA. Where is that? Well, we store the public key of the CA. That's what this is. This is the public key of the CA. But we don't just store the public key of the CA. We usually store it as a certificate because a certificate stores a public key. So this is the certificate of CA which includes the public key of CA. In this case, it was signed by itself. So a self-signed certificate can easily be verified because how do we verify the signature? We've got the public key. Uh, 
Not necessarily, no. Let's see in, in our specific example and see how my browser got the public key. In this example, we said that there was a public key. The subject was EFF.org. The issuer was this StartCom Class 2 primary intermediate server CA. Okay? So let's note, note that. That's the certificate issued by uh, who? StartCom. class 2 and the rest. Okay. So that's the authority. Therefore, to verify the certificate of EFF.org, we need the certificate of StartCom class 2. My browser needs that. Does it have it? Yes. So we, and it's shown here. The StartCom Class 2 certificate is shown here. We see the subject. StartCom Class 2 is the subject, so it's their certificate. Their public key is there. So the public key of StartCom Class 2. And who issued this certificate? Someone else. Similar name, but different. StartCom. CA. The other one was Startcom Class 2 CA. This one's just, let's call it just Startcom. So let's note that. So this second certificate that my browser has is issued by someone else. And let's just call it Startcom. Similar names, it's the same company, but they're different certificates. So in fact, to verify the certificate of EFF.org, we need the public key of Startcom Class 2. The public key of Startcom Class 2 is in the certificate of Startcom Class 2, which my browser has, we just saw it. But to verify that certificate, we would need to have the public key of this Startcom. <coughs> Because how do we trust the certificate of Startcom Class 2? Well, it was issued by another authority. So we can have this hierarchy of authorities. So we need the certificate of Startcom. Because inside there is the public key that we can use to verify the certificate of Startcom Class 2 which contains the public key that can we, we can use to verify the certificate of EFF.org. Who issued the certificate of Startcom? Let's have a look in our browser and it will tell us. Here's the third certificate in my browser. The subject, Startcom Certification Authority. Let's just call it Startcom. The issuer, same. Startcom Certification Authority. This is a self-signed certificate. Startcom has issued their own certificate in this case. Note that this one is self signed. So my browser has all three. The aim was to verify the certificate of EFF. To do so, we use the public key of Startcom Class 2, which was stored in the Certificate of Startcom Class 2, but to verify that public key, we needed to use the public key of Startcom, which was stored in the Certificate of Startcom. But to verify that, well, this is a self signed certificate, so that means we must trust this. 
because it's verified by itself. And we can think of in this hierarchy, this is the root authority. If we trust the root authority, in this case, then we can verify the certificate of Startcom class 2 because we trust Startcom. And if we verify this certificate, then it means we trust Startcom class 2 and therefore we can verify the certificate of EFF.org. So we have this hierarchy of trust. In this, in this one example, there was uh, two authorities. One verified for EFF, or signed for EFF, and the other signed for the, the mid-level authority. In other cases, there may be just one authority or more, more than two. Still, we have a question. Where did my browser get these certificates? Let's have a look. I have a capture that I captured this morning and when I accessed this website before. Okay, in Wireshark I accessed that website and I'm showing the SSL messages. Remember we're using HTTPS. HTTPS is just normal HTTP but first we set up this SSL secure connection. And these are the SSL or TLS is, is the new name. Uh, packets. We don't worry too much about the details. Browser sending to server some hello message, some server sends back hello, agreeing upon some parameters. Then the server, 6950 so on, sends to the browser its certificate. So this packet contains the certificate of the server. Let's look at the details. We expand and we in fact see that there are two certificates in here. It's hard to see, but we'll recognize some information. Uh, to scroll a bit. We'll get there. The so there are two certificates included in this packet. The first one is the subject, it's hard to see, the subject is EFF.org. And the issuer <coughs> is this Startcom class 2 primary CA. So that's the first certificate which was received from the server. In this case, the server also sends a second certificate at the same time. And if we scroll down, we see the second certificate is the subject is Startcom class 2 and the issuer is Startcom. Okay, so these are the, those two top certificates in our diagram. This one and this one. They were sent by the web server to my browser. So, for my browser to verify, my browser now needs to know the certificate of Startcom. That was not sent. Where is it? It was pre-programmed into my browser when I installed my browser. Okay, so the way that it works in practice is that when you, uh, the browser developer, the, man, uh, the people who release the browser, pre pre-configure the browser with a list of certificates of what they say are trusted authorities, organizations that they trust. I'll show you shortly that we'll see inside Firefox there is a certificate for Startcom. It's already in there, in the browser. Therefore, when I contacted this EFF.org web server, the web server sent me these two certificates. My browser used the preloaded certificate of Startcom to verify Startcom class 2 and it then used that to verify the certificate of EFF.org and now it knows and trusts the public key of EFF.org. So we have this hierarchy of certificates. So the self-signed ones are the ones from the trusted authorities and usually pre-loaded pre into your browser. And it's, in practice there are many authorities not just one Startcom, just one company. There are many companies and government organizations which act as authorities.
let's go back just to finish we look at in my browser preferences you can view the certificates and there are different sets and one of them is the set of certificates of authorities and you see the ones listed as built-in object token and they are the preloaded ones so many different organizations have their authority certificate usually a self-signed certificate loaded into the browser when you install the browser uh, we scrolled so we many different companies uh, and, and government organizations here we have the Starcom certificate authority in here in fact there are different Starcom ones there's a top level one that can verify that so there's again a hierarchy of certificates from different authorities so as long as your browser has the certificate of one of the authorities that has issued the certificate of the web server you can verify it but if you receive a certificate from a web server that is issued by someone else who's not in this list what happens what's your browser do it would it it cannot verify the certificate of the web server in that case what does it, the browser do in practice it usually gives a warning saying this is untrusted okay? uh, and you would have seen that when you've accessed some of the internal SIT websites uh, the ICT server registration when you first access the browser presents a warning saying this is an untrusted connection do you really want to continue because the browser cannot verify the certificate because it has a certificate which is either invalid, expired, signed by uh, someone who's not in this list, like signed by themselves. So that's your browser's way of saying, I cannot trust this. You need to decide for yourself whether you want to trust this website. It could be someone performing an attack. So that's how certificates are used for websites. X509 is the format we saw you see in your browser you, you should have a look at the examples but you see there's a version some serial number the algorithms used the issuer the, the timestamp information the subject and the public key information and then followed at the end by the signature it's not just ID PU and T it's more detailed than that there are more details. Certificates may be revoked before they expire. If there's something goes wrong and we no longer trust that certificate, there's a way to revoke them. And there's revocation lists. So to finish, in the last couple of minutes, in practice, you own a website, you're setting up a web server, and you want to obtain a certificate. How do you do it? Well, you need to go to a company or an organization that offers or acts as an authority. And you need to prove your identity to them. The proving of identity may be somehow to prove that you own that domain. So when you set up your website, mygreatcompany.com, then you need to somehow prove to that authority that you own that domain. And it's not so hard to do that there are some extended validations where they'll actually prove that you're the owner of a company so uh, looking at IDs and, and company documents there are, those are both free and commercial there are free services that will do that for you but you can some services cost money especially if you want extended uh, validation uh, how does your browser obtain the CA certificate at least the top level one well it's preloaded into browsers so when you install Firefox it's configured with a set of certificates you can add them you can manipulate them yourself so you can delete some add new ones but normally most users do not we saw that there's a hierarchy of certificates so one authority signs for another authority which signs for another authority which signs for a website 
what if your authority certificate is not in the browser, then usually you get a warning to the, to the user saying, do you, I don't trust this, do you trust this website? That's what the browser says to you. What are the problems? Well, the authorities need some way to make sure that they can identify that you do own that server. And if they don't have good procedures to verify that, then this system may, may fail. The authority's private key, of course, must be kept private because the authority's private key is used to sign certificates. If someone malicious finds the private key of Startcom, then that malicious user could sign any certificate and sign fake certificates. So the private key of the authority needs to be, of course, kept secret. And authorities have, uh, uh, must have policies and, and, and methods to keep them secret. If they're compromised, then many certificates will be compromised. You must trust, in practice, we trust the browser to give preloaded certificates. Has anyone looked at their list of preloaded certificates? Probably not. So you trust your browser to load accurate or correct certificates. If it loads certificates of untrusted authorities, then someone may do attacks by your browser. Of course, what does a user do when they get this warning message? this connection is not trusted. I'm sure all of you have seen that message and you say, ah, oh, let's trust it anyway. But that message may be an indicator that you're being subject to an attack, a man in the middle attack. The algorithms used in the certificates, the hash and the, the encryption algorithms must be strong, but that's usually not an issue. So, that gives us, brings us to the end of digital certificates. What you should do is maybe just have a look at your browser and follow as you visit a few websites, secure websites, just make sure you can follow and understand what's happening. Where are these certificates coming from? What information do they include? And how is that used to verify the public key of the server? That's the main point.